right, um, we will go ahead and get started this morning. Um, thanks for joining us uh, for another wild conversation. I'm here with Erin May Quaid, who is the Advocacy Director at Gender Justice. Um, just a few things before we get started. Um, this is a webinar, and so all of our attendees are on mute. Um, if you have questions, which we absolutely encourage, please type those into the Q&A box, and our moderator will go ahead and um, direct those to Erin. Um, if we do need to restart this webinar for any reason, please check your email for a new link, and we are recording this session as well. Um, thank you for joining. This is a program of WILD. WILD's mission is to harness the collective power of TCDIP's membership to remedy systemic anti-Black racism in the Twin Cities by partnering with and amplifying the work of existing community organizations. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our excellent moderator, Lucas Castor. Lucas is a civil rights and plaintiff's employment attorney at Nichols Castor. He's a member of the Minnesota Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on, on Civil Rights, and he is the recruiting lead for our Emerging Leaders Group. All right, and with that, um, we will go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I appreciate that, and welcome to everybody uh, who's in attendance. Um, as Liz referenced, uh, we're here for our fifth uh, installment of, of Wild Conversations regarding uh, addressing uh, systemic racism, racism in community uh, safety. And we're excited to welcome uh, Aaron May Quaid uh, today, who is uh, the current ad advocacy director at Gender Justice and a former member of the U.S. Uh, or the Minnesota House of Representatives, I should say. It's almost a promotion there. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick, right? That was quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, th thank you to you and, and welcome this morning. We appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So I want to start uh, today and talk a little bit about um, your background, where you came from. I understand you uh, at least grew up part of your time in, in Apple Valley um, and then ended up going to school here. Can you explain that a little bit to us? Yeah. So I'm Erin May Quaid. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I was born and raised in Apple Valley, where I live now. We're coming live to you from Apple Valley, Minnesota. Um, and I um, went to the University of St. Thomas, where I majored in political science, justice and peace studies, and theology. So war, religion, and politics, the three things you're never supposed to talk about. Those were my majors. I was a hit at dinner parties. Um, and after that, I got my start in community organizing, working in politics and um, I worked for Barack Obama and his first presidential campaign. I worked for Governor Dayton, um, now Attorney General, then Congressman Keith Ellison. Then myself, I was elected to the uh, Minnesota House of Representatives in 2016 and uh, represented my community that I was born and raised in for a term there. Ran for Lieutenant Governor, lost a primary, joined Gender Justice as the Advocacy Director, and here we are. So talk to us a little bit about your experience uh, in the legislature. Was that something you always thought you would be interested in? And how was that experience when you actually got there? Yeah, so no, I did not expect to be a state of officials. Um, I really love policy work. Like the thing I miss most about being a legislator is committee. And I wonder how many other of my former colleagues share that. Like most people don't like committee. I love committee. I love like digging into the language of bills. Um, and so, you know, I, I was moved by the issue of childhood hunger. It had grown in my community 385% um, in the like 10 years since I had graduated from high school and hungry kids can't learn. And so I was moved to do something. And Keith Ellison at the time, who was my boss was like, I was gonna, you know, do work with like the church and the businesses. And he was like, why don't you run for office and deal with the systems that don't allow people to feed their kids and, and pay rent in the same month. And I was like, Oh, okay. I'll do that. Uh, so that was how I got my start in, in running for office. And then um, after that, uh, you transitioned to gender justice. And, and what do you explain your role there? And what are you guys doing there? Yeah, so gender justice, we are a legal and policy advocacy nonprofit where we seek to advance gender equity through the law. And, um, you know, I always say that my job as the advocacy director is to, oh gosh, this is a ter like a terrible place to just say this, but I always say my job is to explain what we do to like regular people. And I classify regular people as anyone who's not a lawyer. <laughs> We're not a direct service organization. How do we take um, our 
our clients and the issues that they're facing, and we can help people understand where barriers gender equity lay. Um, how do we fix them in the law? How do we take challenges to the Minnesota Human Rights Act um, or, or actually enforce the Human Rights Act and make sure that we have a um, state that's a place where everyone can thrive? So, um, and, and, you know, wealthy people and not wealthy people, although it tends to, you know, err on the side of wealthy people, less so now. Um, and so, you know, I think there wasn't a, a downside to being not a lawyer. I will say that now that I'm out of the legislature and I work with really smart lawyers, um, in particular, Christy Holler, senior staff attorney, and Jess Braverman, our legal director, there are ways in which lawyers understand the law that legislators who aren't lawyers, or actually it might be legislators who aren't like public defenders, right? Um, understand how a law that says this ends up doing that. And I don't know if that information always gets back to legislators. So I have found it to be helpful to work with a former public defender um, and a senior staff attorney who's just really embedded in anti-discrimination law to learn more about ways that the legislature might have messed it up a little bit and uh, how we can be more thoughtful. Yeah, I've listened to some of uh, all of your uh, sort of web talks like this that you've had with gender. Oh, the Scotus chats. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've listened to some of those and I uh, am always intrigued uh, not only by uh, your uh, legal team's knowledge about the issues, but also your uh, you know, knowledge. I think that's one of the things as lawyers we often forget and, and, and overlook is how people the different perspective that people who don't have a legal background can provide to the legal context of what we're trying to do because it comes from a more real world outside the structure of in the box of the legal world and and so i thought those conversations that you've had uh were very uh enlightening entertaining because you provide the sort of regular world perspective your legal team provides the more legal uh so i really enjoyed those conversations that you've had I enjoy them. It's really just Jess explaining to me like what the law is and me being like, did I hear that right? Like, did I hear that a, a constitutional originalist is like someone who would do what the framers did, but like it's a woman. So like, tell me what that means, right? Like it's just her explaining the law to right. me and then me explaining the legislature to her. That's kind of how we, how we roll. Yeah. Well, it's great. Um, and I encourage anybody uh, when you have those all again, to, uh, I encourage everyone to jump on and watch those. They're great conversations. Um, and I want to transition here slightly to, you know, obviously we're talking about uh, addressing systemic racism and community safety, police reform, however you define that, um, in the midst of, you know, everything that happened in, in our city, in our state this summer. Um, you know, and I know you have taken uh, some stances on things I recall when you were in the legislature, you led a 24-hour sit-in on, on gun violence, right? Can you explain how that came about and, and what your thought was at that time? Yeah, so I, I'm a DFLer. I was elected as a Democrat. And when I was in the legislature, Democrats were in the minority in both the House and the Senate. And um, New, um, not Newtown, um, uh, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting happened in Florida. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm 34, so I'm a product of the Columbine era. I was like about to go into high school. And there was a moment where I was walking out of the Capitol and it was um, coming up on the anniversary of Columbine. The Star Tribune had just done a uh, poll and found that 89% of Minnesotans supported background checks on all gun sales, including like 77% of gun owners. Um, and, and we'd seen these walkouts from classrooms and these, you know, protests and demonstrations from students. And I just had this overwhelming sense of how absolutely pissed I was that a bill that 89% of Minnesotans support could not even get a hearing. And then I'm imagining, like, I've never done a lockdown drill. That is something I went through school never having to do. And I was just thinking about what would I want someone with like a modicum of power to do if I was a student or if I was a parent or if I was just a person who um, had been affected by gun violence. And so I decided to, you know, part of demonstration and, and protesting is to like make people uncomfortable, right? And the legislature is very much about like norms and decorum and discipline, like less so in the House than the Senate, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, but still, like it's very, you know, rigid. And so I figured I'm just going to sit here for 24 hours and like make people uncomfortable enough to say like, it's not okay that we're not responding to this call. And I really thought that I would like say it, do it, and that people would be like, all right, go ahead and that no one would care and it really did resonate with a lot of folks so I'm, I'm glad I decided to do it. it was is exhausting my butt hurt after I 
always say that my butt hurt after 24 hours because I did sit there the whole time. But um, it was, I told the stories of Minnesotans who had died by gun violence in the state and the people who wouldn't, whose stories wouldn't get told in the people's house because we wouldn't even have a hearing on a bill. And, you know, sort of functionally, I, I, a question that came in my mind as you were describing that story is, you know, are, were the other uh, members of the house present when you were doing this in, or was it just sort of like word of mouth spreading that you were in the chamber sitting the whole time? Good question. I announced it, like, you know, you go through the floor session and then like at the very end, it's like announcements and then people be like, you know, there's a gathering of legislators from this district, like, come join us. Or like, this chamber is here, come join us. And I was like, I'll be sitting in for 24 hours. I remember Brian Bax was like, did Representative Mayquay just say she's going to sit in? I was like, yes, I did. So I had announced it to everyone. I had told um, colleagues ahead of time, like I had alerted our, our caucus leader. Um, and I think she had told the speaker. So, um, and I'd let Capital security now because they had to have somebody there overnight. So um, my colleagues knew and people joined me and sat with me all night long. And so it was like the end of one day and I was there for the rest of the day all night. And then throughout the morning of the next day session and after 20, I mean, I'd been up for longer than 24 hours, but I'd been sitting there for 24 hours. It was a really like wild experience to be like sitting in front of the speaker's dais while people were like, you know, passing in their bills and like, you know, signing onto other people's bills. I'm just sitting there like exhausted. It was a very um, out of body experience. Sure. Interesting. So, um, you know, t coming from that, uh, obviously you have a background in the legislature, um, you have a background in policy and all of those things. When, when everything, you know, happened in our city, in our state this summer, what was your either your professional reaction, your personal reaction, what was just sort of your gut response to what was going on? And, and after George Floyd was murdered? Correct. Um, you know, I woke up at 5 a.m. Okay, so uh, sometimes I'll have these like feelings, like I feel like something's going to happen. I woke up at 5 a.m. on March 20th or on May 25th and I like just got on Twitter. I think I was one of the like first hundred people who saw the video posted. And I like, it hit me in the gut I mean, it, you know, we've seen so many of these videos, Sandra Bland, um, we've seen uh, Walter Scott, we've seen Eric Garner, like we've seen so many of these videos and it just hits you in this way that um, you almost have to like shut down in order to protect yourself from like the overwhelming grief and rage that, that can go through you. Um, so I like put the phone down, I went back to sleep because I was like, when, we, when I get up actually for this day, like it's going to be a day. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the first time that you know, black organizers and colleagues of mine had gathered together in like support of each other. I mean, we really, it was just like black folks on a call being like, how are you doing? What are we going to do? Knowing it's a pandemic, um, you know, half of black Minnesotans at the time, I don't know if that's still the case, but it's probably likely are unemployed. Um, this is not the first time, you know, I worked for Congressman Ellison when Jamar Clark was shot in Minneapolis. Um, and there was a demonstration in occupation of the fourth precinct for 18 days. White supremacists shot demonstrators outside the fourth. I mean, like I was there, that was like a hundred yards from my office. Um, and so it just, it was reminiscent of that pain um, and that time. And so we just got to organizing to figure out how do we organize people? How do we keep people safe? And then um, what are we gonna do? And I think because the whole world was kind of inside it put the whole world's attention on this and it happened on the heels of Ahmaud Arbery and it happened on the heels of Brianna Taylor and you know we've just been building up building up building up and um and so I, I just I think I, I um organized my way through the grief because it's just easy sometimes to say like I have to look away and it's okay that that people do because it's hard but I organized through the grief because it was the only thing I knew how to do and you you said something uh as you were talking you said you know what do we do um, so let's talk about what is it that we do. And, and, and as we were talking uh, yesterday in preparation for today, I was I was asking you about you know there's a bunch of discussion about police reform and reforming the police and and defund the police and and you gave an interesting perspective on this idea of reforming the police and why you might think that that's not the way at the end of the day to go. Can you explain? Uh, what you what you mean by that? Well, I can tell you what I um, oftentimes folks say things like um, the the police system is broken, and I will tell folks that the police system is not broken; it's functioning exactly as it was meant to. And what 
I think we collectively as a society are feeling this like frustration and this angst and like we have to do something is that what the police system was designed to do, we don't want it to do that thing anymore, right? So that's the good news. The good news is that we've kind of all said we don't want that to be happening. But the, the reason that the police system exists, right? It was created out of slave patrols and it was meant to protect property. And then, you know, when enslaved people were property at the time, return them to their owners um, on plantations. And <clears throat> after emancipation, um, you know, and black folks were, were free to roam, I guess, uh, throughout the country, um, you started seeing more the Jim Crow era laws. You saw these mass terrorist events where they burned down like Black Wall Street and some, they called them race riots, right? But you know, attacking a, a black community is not a riot, it's just a terrorist attack. Um, and so you started to see the passing of bills, the ascription of criminality to black people. It's why in the Minnesota state constitution, it said there shall be neither slavery nor indentured servitude, except as punishment for a crime. And so by ascribing criminality to black folks, it was a way to um, control their movements, where they could go, what we could do, what you know, houses we could buy, what schools we could go to, could we go to the pool? Answer is no. And the police system was used to, to use, it was the tool to, of enforcement for those racist policies, right? And so over time, um, I think we've come to think of the police system as something that protects and serves, but that's not what it was designed to do. What it was designed to do was to control the movements and actions and behaviors of black people and then you know indigenous people immigrant communities, low-income people, people with mental illness, right? It's, it's kind of expanded over time um, and to protect property. And so what we run into in this, this feeling of just like, we don't know what to do, right? As a collective is because we are confronting the fact that we have a system whose function we don't want anymore, right? We don't want the outcomes. And so I think it's on us to, to dream about what is it that we want? What are we trying to achieve? And then, and then what system gets us there? And what, you know, speaking of that, what do you envision as, you know, um, changing that system or, or, or as you said, reimagining, you know, getting a basically a new system? What do you envision as part of that process uh, to get there? How do you see that new system existing? That's a good question. I mean, I think the first thing I'll say too is that I don't live in the city of Minneapolis. I, I live in the city of, of Apple Valley. And I think this is a deeply local and community conversation that people should be having. Policing in Apple Valley is different than policing in Minneapolis, which is different than policing in Zimbroda. Um, I always go like A to Z, right? Apple Valley to Zimbroda um, or Alexandria to Zimbroda, um, right? Different communities. And so I think each community needs to have a conversation about like, what is it that, what are the needs, right? What's, what is, who is being harmed and how? And then how do we stop that? Um, because I think we can all agree that, well, I shouldn't say we all, I shouldn't speak for anybody else. I think the general idea with the police system was that this is a form of safety and protection, but we know that that's actually not what we're getting. And so what does provide safety? I always say safety is a an outcome of an invested in and healthy community, right? It's not something that you can like enforce. It is a product of a healthy and invested in community. Um, and so how do we invest in our community to achieve safety? How do we invest in people? How do we rehumanize people, right? Because let's be clear, the police system requires dehumanization of both the people in it and the people being policed, right? It's not healthy for any person who's in it. Um, and I, I think a lot of times there's this want to demonize like individual officers and that it's not, you know, individual officers do not create the police system. They be, are being put into it and then asked to carry it out. And so um, when I think about what we need to achieve, it does start with local conversations, but it also starts with acknowledging that we know the answers to what creates a safe and healthy community. The question is, do we have the will to do those things, right? Because I a lot of times we'll say like, I want safety, but I don't want to pay for fully funded schools. Well, it's like, well, then you don't want safety, right? Like, because those two go hand in hand. And so are we willing to understand and acknowledge that we do know the solutions and then actually do them? Yeah. And there's been a lot of discussion, um, you know, in the news uh, around the country, in our state, uh, since George Floyd was murdered this summer, um, you know, about police accountability, about, you know, this concept of, well, we need to weed out the bad, the bad apples, uh, as people say. Um, do you think in, in your mind, is that enough? to weed out the bad apples within the, the police department? 
I, I'm loath to dehumanize police officers to say that like there are mostly good ones and then there are some bad ones. Like that is the same kind of dehumanization that happens to people who are being policed, right? Is that like, well, most people are good, but there's like these bad people. And then we have to like send other people to deal with them and like disappear them into, you know, jails and prisons. Um, and so I, I really think that the issue is the system, not the people. And so we can put good people into a bad system and still have a bad system. We can reform a bad system and still have a bad system. And so, um, I, you know, accountability, right? Like when we move to this future, this vision where we have safe and healthy and thriving invested in communities, right? There is a long road to get there. It's not happening tomorrow. It's not happening next year. And so in the meantime, right, this is the system we have. What are the harm reduction steps that we can take? And I do think that there are, are places there to talk about and not even accountability, but just what is, I mean, police are, are agents of the state. They are agents of us. And, you know, I was talking about before when I was in the legislature, there's a lot of like decorum. There's not a lot of laws that govern you, right? It's discipline. Democracy requires discipline. And, um, you know, you, you think about the military, right? They're agents of our, our government and our, our country when they're in other countries. And it's why they're so strict about like this uniform. And because when you're at war, if you're not disciplined, like it kind of goes haywire. And so we have agents of us, like in our community, what is the behavior we want to be demonstrating, right? What does the, these agents of our government and our community, what do we want them to be demonstrating? And so um, I think, accountability yes but it's like um how can we make a culture where that is where um doing the right thing is comfortable and and the desire and like the thing that should be happening because i think the culture um on the inside is the is often the time or often the thing that like prompts um not doing some of the accountability pieces that we're talking about yeah, and, and you referenced, you know, this this culture of, of trying to get whoever it is to do the right thing, whether it's police officers, whether it's the general public. Um, and, you know, when we were talking yesterday, you referenced, you know, this idea of we, we tend to focus as a culture on uh, with respect to criminality and the, the, you know, the general public that, you know, uh, the police are there to stop crime, to prevent crime, to remedy crime. And you had a different perspective on what actually causes crime and what we can do to prevent it other than more police on the ground, more jails, more cells, things like that. Can you explain what your perspective was on, on how we can, as a society, work to prevent crime in, in a more sustainable way, I think? Sure. I mean, the first is that crime is a construct right? Like people designed all the systems, we made all the laws. And so, um, I, you know, I was sharing with you, like, if I came into your house and I poisoned your water, like I would be guilty of a crime for poisoning you, right? Um, but if I was the city manager of Flint, Michigan and poisoned an entire city of people, there's no culpability there. Um, the Sackler family is testifying in front of Congress today, right? Like if I sold you drugs, I would be guilty of a crime. But if I made a drug, lied to the doctors who I was telling it to be like, it's not addictive at all and got them to sell it to everybody and got them hooked. Apparently there's, that's not a crime, right? Um, if I stole a hundred dollars from you, that's a crime. Uh, but if I worked, if you worked for me and I stole a hundred dollars of your wages, it's not a crime where, you know, I would go to jail for. So I think part of it is like reframing how we think about crime. Um, oftentimes we think about like individual behavior that we want to police, right? Um, and, and, have go away. We don't want people to be spitting. We don't want people lurking. We don't want people gathering. We don't want people with tinted windows and loud music, right? Like it's about policing activity. But when we think about the things that actually harm people, it tends to be things like I was talking about, right? It's like systemic things. Um, you know, it's illegal to starve your children, but it's not illegal to pay someone so little that they can't feed their children, right? Like, I, you know, we have to think about what is crime. Um, but, but the things that we typically think about um, you know, robberies, sexual assault, sexual violence, um, murder, I, you know, whatever the things that pop into people's head, we know the things that gun violence, we know the things that contribute to those things. And it's uh, lack of investment in community, lack of job opportunity, lack of education, lack of inclusion, right? A lot of 
a lot of these things are intersecting with disability and colorism um, and, you know, where you live and who you live with and what, you know, there was a amazing piece, six pieces through the Washington Post that detailed George Floyd's um, family history and life. And even just going through that, like you can see all of the places where, you know, these things come up. And so we know what stops the way we think about crime as crime, fully funding schools, paid family medical leave, healthcare for every single person, a living wage, deeply affordable housing, stopping the climate crisis, not, you know, parking a bunch of kids next to a garbage burner and letting them breathe that in all the time, right? Like these are the things um, that reduce what we think of as crime. But I also think we need to start thinking about the ways that communities and whole people are harmed as also being a crime. Like there are climate refugees in this country. It should be a crime that we are not stopping the climate crisis and running people out of where they live, right? So on and on and on, but yeah. So how do we, um, how do we shift or let me ask you a question in two parts. Why do you think we're not having that that conversation about those larger issues? Or I shouldn't say we're not. Why is that not the central theme of this discussion around police reform? And how do we shift the conversation away from a police department to a community that supports all of its people to reduce crime? How do we, why aren't we having that conversation? How do we make that shift? Why aren't we having that conversation? Um, the, I, you know, good question. Um, I think that there has been, there is, um, I'm gonna call everybody back to the Democratic primary and the, the um, moderator would ask a question about, you know, student loan debt or they, would, or they would talk about race and racism and people would always go to crime and criminal justice reform. And so I think we just have this um, automatic association with like, okay, if we want to fix the police system, then the only thing we should be talking about are the people who are police officers and the communities that they police and like nothing else. Um, and it's just like a really narrow uh, view of looking at how people are and how, you know, ecosystems work. And so I think that's part of it. But I also think that we don't have enough people who take the time to like bring in those other topics to be like, education is deeply intertwined with any sort of system of policing. Um, affordable housing and a living wage is deeply intertwined with conversations about violence and policing. Um, comprehensive sex education, where we teach people how to have healthy relationships with their own bodies and other people, deeply intertwined to um, safety and, and police um, policing in this country. So I think um, it's because we wanna pretend like it's a tinker here and a tinker there. And there's just like this one thing that's wrong. And if we could just find the one thing, cause it's, it's, it'd be nice if it was easy. Um, and it's not easy. And I think that might be why is because, you know, hard stuff is hard, <laughs> but we can do hard things. We built all these systems. We're right. the best people qualified to rebuild them. Right. And, you know, one of the things there, there's obviously been uh, a lot of language around this phrase of defunding the police uh, since the summer before this summer. Um, and it's become that phrase has, you know, become pretty divisive, uh, within, I think our communities generally, um, you know, how do you view this idea of defunding the police and why do you think that term has become so divisive in our communities? Well, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that, um, you know, most things that black folks say in the streets as a collective tend to end up being divisive, right? Like Black Lives Matter was divisive five years ago. Um, I, I mean, it's, it still can be, people call them terrorist groups and, that, and the like. Um, I remember seeing um, cartoons that my dad saved out of the paper from when he was younger, he's 70, in his 70s. And so when MLK was doing the um, freedom rides, it would be like a picture of MLK and it'd be like this burning city and it'd be somebody be like, how's your nonviolent protest going out, right? So like there is always um, uh, demeaning and denigration about people who are fighting for liberation, right? Because there are people who are invested in oppression, not many, but there are some who are very invested in it because it's a system that benefits them. Um, and so I think there's the weaponization of um, 
and, and also the like ascription of criminality, right? Like black people are dangerous. And like, if no one is going to like control the black people, then like, what will happen? They'll just walk around free. You know, there is this like underlying sense of that. But I also think that people can get really caught up in like messaging as if we aren't all aware of what the asks are and where it came from and why it exists, right? So asking people to invest in communities to say, if we want people to be safe, can we have livable wages and can we invest in that? Can we, you know, to conflate that with like your slogan is bad. Um, activists aren't PR people. They're fighting for, you know, their lives. And so um, I, I think it's important to say that this is a call from a community um, and people who live in that community. And again, like folks who live in that community should listen to each other and have these conversations. I always encourage people to not debate over what's being said, but what is actually being asked for and offered and how can we reconcile that? I think the more often we get into a debate about whether it's the best way to say it, the more we are letting um, the worst form of this conversation happen. Like, I wouldn't care if it was like, whatever you type it out in wingdings, if it meant that we get safe, thriving, and healthy communities, like that's what we can call it, you know? So. Yeah. And you referenced uh, before, I want to go to, because you've referenced now uh, a couple times, you referenced, you know, paying people a livable, a livable wage as, you know, one of the things you see in, in the realm of a broader spectrum of things to address, you know, I, I, there, there hasn't been, in, in my view, there hasn't been a lot of discussion or, or explanation about, you know, what you're saying, these broader policy issues and tying them to this idea of police reform. I think, um, you know, as you said, uh, I, I very much agree with you about the fact that, that we were in a pandemic not only locally, but across the world. And everybody was sitting, watching this video and could not escape because all they were doing was sitting on their couch. You know, they couldn't go with friends and just sort of avoid what was happening. Um, you know, and, and so it caused this sort of, uh, this storm of information. Um, but how do we get from you know, this conversation about the specifics of police reform to this idea of, you know, tying, for example, like you said, paying people a livable wage. How do we have that, you know, how do you see that connecting to this idea of police reform or defunding the police? I want to, I want to try to kind of hit that concept home because I haven't seen people having that conversation. And I, I want to know, like, how do we tie, how do you tie those two things together and how do we start having that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think if you talk to um, law enforcement officers, particularly in bigger cities, but really anywhere in the state or the country, um, they can tell you as they've told me, right? Like I can't help people make ends meet at the end of the month. I can't, you know, pay their rent for them. I can't help them access healthcare they can't afford. I can't help them get to their job, um, you know, if they don't have a car or if the taillight in their car is out and they've get, you know, their license is suspended. You know, blah 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 blah, right? Um, and so I think you'll you will hear from law enforcement over and over again that like the the things that they are called to attend to are usually far outside. Uh, the scope of even their described job. And so you think about the causes of, of like crime as we think about it, right? Um, it tends to be lack of opportunity, poverty, um, or being stuck in cycles and systems, right? And so if you think about like being incarcerated, um, right? How does society feel about you if you like stole something because you needed it or wanted it or whatever, um, now you're incarcerated and now you're just like in a cell where no one, like you don't have healthcare there either. You're just kind of sitting around, programming might come in and out. And then when you're released, uh, you have, you know, it's just like, it's the, it's the cycle on purpose, right? Um, it's designed to be a cycle. And so that tells you then how does your community and how does your state feel about you? Well, then how do you feel about your community? How do you feel about your state, right? So we just, we dehumanize folks so much. Paying people enough money to live is like one of the most basic ways we can say there is dignity in all work and every person has inherent worth and dignity. That no matter what job you have, you are a person who deserves to live a life with stable housing and enough food and you know have joy and all that kind of stuff and be free. And so when I talk about like a livable wage, it's just such a basic way of saying, um, you are a person with worth who deserves to live a full life. And we have said in law that the, the least you can be paid is enough to live, 
And that's not what it says in law right now. <laughs> that, is not, that is not what it says. I can, I can confirm that. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I, in preparation, uh, I read an article uh, that was an interview with you in response to some of the legislature's proposals for bills in response to, you know, the events this summer in George Floyd's murder about, you know, banning chokeholds and, and yeah. getting rid of the warrior training and things of that nature. Um, and you were, you know, you expressed obviously a displeasure with unable, the, the legislature's inability to come to a larger agreement. Um, and, you know, you're talking about sort of reimagining and some of the things that we've heard, for example, in these other conversations are, you know, we've heard a lot of conversation about, for example, the co-responder model to, to responding to health, uh, mental health crises, that it wouldn't mm -hmm. just be a police officer, it'd be a mental health professional. Um, in your view, you know, are those things enough, it, you know, in terms of when we're talking about police reform, do you see those initiatives, those proposals that have been put forth as something that are actually going to affect the change that we want to see? So we talked, you know, I talked about harm reduction, right? Like what are the things we can do to reduce harm in the immediate? And I think, um, you know, having mental health respondents are good and helpful. I can say honestly that, you know, the people who are identified as having a mental health crisis versus like violent person who's dangerous often fall on color lines, right? Race lines. And so I think we've seen this with, um, you know, I think the Minneapolis Police Department at one point had, um, they were giving out like vouchers for people who had um, taillights out or windows out for free to get them repaired. Well, and they found that it just, they gave them to white drivers that they pulled over and not black and brown drivers and indigenous drivers that they pulled over, right? And so how do we account for in these solutions, the fact that anti-Black racism still exists and it's very much built into the world we live in. It's very much built into the police system and the criminal justice system as a whole. How are we accounting for that? And how are we making sure then that there is equity in these proposals? Um, you know, we've had, I think since, um, we've, you know, we've had implicit bias training, avoiding racial profiling, crisis intervention on mental illness teams, community and policing, training for response to hate crimes, working with victims and perpetrators of violence, body cams, community engagement teams, banning war. I mean, these are all things that we've done in the last like 10 years and we still have what we have. And so it goes back to like the system itself is what's wrong. It's not like, and if we just had <laughs> this like one policy, um, it would fix everything. And so I, you know, again, harm reduction is good and mental health providers are good. We absolutely can and should invest in a robust mental health. We should build and then maintain a robust mental health system, healthcare system in this state. But, um, you know, we have to account for the ways in which the anti-Black racism shows up in the way that we carry out and execute some of these policies. And I, I have a question, uh, you know, one of the, uh, because of the divisiveness of this, of this topic this summer, um, we've seen the, the defund the police kind of uh, discussion. We've also seen, you know, uh, support the blue, those sort of comments about, you know, supporting the, the police. What's, you know, and, and some of the response from the, the people who are on the, the supporting the police side say, well, you're, you know, you're demonizing the police, you're making them uh, these, you know, uh, the, the police officers, uh, they're not all bad. They're not, you know, they're trying to keep their, their, their community safe. They're working hard. What's your response to people who say that in having a discussion about reimagining the public safety department, we are inherently saying that police officers are bad. Do you have, like, what's your response to that? Well, how, what have I said police officers are bad today? I don't, I don't think you have, but, but that's what people are, are uh, saying in response to the defunding the police. I mean, I, I, you know, from, from my individual perspective, I understand, you know, I understand some of the, the response from police officers themselves because that's their livelihood. That's their job, right? I, I get that response. Um, what I struggle with and what I'm interested in your perspective is uh, the general public's response to say, well, I'm going to support the police no matter what because they're here to protect us. Um, and you're basically saying that there's no good police. By saying we want to change the system and reimagine the system, we're saying 
they're bad inherently and we need to change them. Um, how do we how do we respond to that? And, and what's your response to that? I mean, what I would say is that the police system is damaging to everybody who's part of it. Police, people who are being policed, it dehumanizes everybody who's in it. Um, the number of times, right, that we talk about PTSD that police officers experience, that's very real. And it's because they are dealing, we are asking law enforcement officers most often to deal with the issues that we're like, la, 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 I don't want to hear about it. Why don't you go deal with it? And then uh, when, you know, when we teach people to view people they're policing, right, which is what Warrior Shire Training has done as a threat, as an enemy, and that you are always in danger from them, um, that's how they'll treat those folks. And then you start seeing each other as opposition. And so my assertion always is that the police system is harming everybody who's in it. And we have all the evidence in the world that we need for that. And so by talking about reimagining it, that includes law enforcement because as an organizer, right? My goal is to organize myself out of a job. I would love for gender justice to not have to exist anymore because we have achieved gender equity. And my hope is that for law enforcement officers, they hope that we get to a world in which the way they imagine themselves serving and protecting the community is no longer necessary, right? And so it is not to say like, you're bad and we hate you. It's to say, the system is not serving us at all. How can we work together to create what, we, what it is that we do want? And we need the perspective and the um, experiences of people who have been tasked to deal with the things that, you know, lawmakers and communities have so long ignored to say like, what are you seeing, right? Because it is traumatic and it is um, hard and it is, you know, a lot. So how can we understand what that is and then actually address root cause? And you, you referenced, you know, uh, this idea of reimagining do you, in your mind, do you envision, you know, say we get to this ideal place that we're talking about uh, with respect to community safety, do you envision police or some version of police still existing? Sure. I mean, it's reimagining, right? Like, what, what is it that we, that we want? And I guess my question back to you would be, um, in this world that we've reimagined, um, for what purpose? Like, what is it that we are looking for for that thing? Because I think so often it's like, um, this is really random. I have never watched a makeup YouTube tutorial until like two weeks ago. I'm not really into makeup, but I was watching one and she had like all these different brushes and she's like, this brush is for this thing and this brush is for, and I was like, well, I'm going to stop watching this. I don't, I have one brush. Um, but it's like, okay, how can we get, this is such a wonderful analogy that I'm just sure just applies to everybody. How can we get the right makeup brush for the right thing? And so I think it's asking like, what is that thing um, that we would use the police system for? Because it's, it's actually not about like the individual officers, right? It's about what's the system. And so what would that be? And what would we use it for? And, and, and what do we hope to get out of it? So I think that would be my bigger question. Um, you know, yeah. And what do you... You talked earlier on about, you know, the the origin of police and public safety and where that came from. And, and you asked me this question yesterday, and I'm going to ask it back to you now. What do you think the police are providing to us today that we're unwilling to get rid of in this reimagining process? Well, would you mind answering first? I, your, your answer for me was actually really helpful. It's, it's such a personal thing that it, it's, it gives insight to where people's minds are at when we talk about this. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I, that I said yesterday was um, I heard something recently that, that was talking about uh, police and, and, you know, I think um, as, a, as someone who was formerly uh, a criminal defense lawyer and, and being in the system and seeing it, experiencing different things, I have this differing view or competing view of, of how I view the criminal justice system, how I view police generally. Um, and it, it's a struggle between, I think, how I grew up and the function of, of um, growing up in a society that is used to that function of police and that they're, uh, they're in a position of, of authority and we should respect them. Um, and you know uh, that they should never be sort of demonized in some way and that they provide us some sense of order. And that's, that was 
that was what I heard the other day that that sort of struck me was it police uh, as we see them provides a structure of order that the majority is comfortable with. Mm. And if we take away that order, it calls into question our own comfort. Mm. Um, so that was my, that was sort of my answer uh, yesterday. So I'll ask it back to you. Today. What, do you what do you think the police yeah. provide in the public? Well, and I, I, I think, I think I should talk about it in, in terms of um, like, what do police provide for me? And I can say, you know, as a black woman who is very light skinned, who is tiny, like I'm five foot two, um, you know, we all have a collective thickening going on. So I'm not like as quite as like weight tiny as I used to be, but I'm still pretty short. Um, and I'm young and I'm very feminine. So I'm, I'm rather non-threatening. And so my proximity to whiteness means that often uh, police provide for me personally, um, like a safety, right? Like I, I am quite sure, sure that if I, needed something, if I needed to call the police, that they would believe me, that they would take me seriously, that they would not, you know, if I called the police and they showed up, they wouldn't think that I was the person maybe that I called the police on. Um, and, and that's, that's true, right? Like that is a privilege that I, that I live with. Um, I do think that it's important for every person to ask themselves, especially if they're struggling with this, like, I want to support, you know, what folks are asking for. I want to support this reimagining and I'm scared to like really interrogate that. What is the fear and or what is it that exists for you now that you're scared of not existing in the future? Because I think so often when we think about reimagining, um, we, we say, okay, nothing changes and then the police go away. Well, that's terrifying, right? Like nothing else changes and then the police go away. And for some people that's not terrifying actually. They're like, that would be a, a much like um, lower level of anxiety for me. Um, but I think we need to ask, what is it that we, what is it that we need, right? So I think sometimes people think of police as preventing crime. That's not really a function they do. They show up after a crime has happened usually, but they don't provide victim services, right? And we don't actually do that much. We have some support at the state level for victim services, but not nearly enough. Um, and so like, what's the actual purpose? And right now, a lot of times it's like protection of property. Um, and then it is um, kind of, helping to facilitate removal of people that make us uncomfortable from society. Um, that really is what we have, we have tasked them with that. That is what we have said police should do. That is not something they just like came into work and were like, hey, you know what we should do? Like that is what we as a society have tasked law enforcement with. Um, and as we've done that, then we continue to criminalize poverty. We criminalize mental illness. We criminalize disability. We criminalize substance use disorder. Um, and so then we further task law enforcement with just like dealing with that, make it go away. Um, and so I would say that they have been called to do that. That is the like community call we have made. How do we stop doing that? Instead of saying, can you make that person go away? Let's say, how can we get this person help? And we've really allowed um, ourselves to put like this layer of dehumanization between each other whether it is us as community members, whether it's us as, you know, person, community member to the law enforcement officer and back and forth. It, it really has required us to forget about the humanity of every single person in order to be like those people, whatever those people are, right? And that is the thing when we were talking before about like the, you know, people who are on this side and people who are on this side, like I'm never going to buy into the dehumanization of any people who are part of this because we are all humans with inherent worth and dignity. And it's time that we start talking to each other like that and hearing each other and then thinking of solutions that root that humanity at the center. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you know, you were saying um, we see the function of, of police as, as taking those people who, who, whoever it is that we're uncomfortable by and, and moving them away from us. And a thought came into my mind that I have thought uh, for a long time, especially as, as someone who was a criminal defense lawyer, I was always struck when I would go to my clients. Um, I was in Milwaukee. But most of the time, I had to go visit my clients 45 minutes away. They weren't in the city. There wasn't, you know, there was there was uh, a small jail in the city, um, you know, for people who were arrested and held for a short amount of time. Um, but even from a pretrial before they were convicted, they would be held way far away in the middle of nowhere. 
And you think that that is sort of a function of what you are saying that basically take these people away. I don't want to see them deal with them. Right. That's actually what we do. It's like move them away. And do you, you know, one of the things uh, we talked about uh, yesterday and I brought up to you because, you know, we had a discussion uh, with Andrea Brown last time, who's a public defender and uh, was uh, the chair of the Police Conduct and Oversight Commission. Um, and one of the things, themes in, in her discussion was this idea of what do we do in the meantime? Uh -huh. uh, let's have that larger reimagining discussion. But what do we do now to affect the people who are affected on a daily basis by our current system? How do you see that? You know, what do we do in the meantime? Yeah. So um, in the meantime, I think it's that we start investing in those systems that we know reduce um, the like stated needs that we have for the police system itself. Um, it's investing in you know, universal pre-K, childcare, paid family medical leave, um, kind of that whole education piece. It's um, deeply affordable housing, like the number of people who are, who are unhoused in, in this state, this very usually cold state, right now it's not very cold, um, is skyrocketing. And when you are unhoused, like that is all the stability gone away. Um, and it, I mean, housing is pretty much the first thing that you need in order to kind of like stack everything on top of that. Um, we need, um, I kind of lost my train of thought, I'm sorry, but it was, I mean, it's starting with those things, right? Like it actually, the, the in the meantime stuff um, starts by reinvesting in our communities so that the people that we have generally tasked police to deal with, disappear, whatever, um, are actually getting the supports that they need to be full members of our community that we value and, and honor their existence. Um, and so I, I do think that our in the meantime stuff actually just exists a lot of the time outside of talking about like what um, different law or amendments can happen or like what post board thing can happen because I do think that we've kind of, I think we've really done a lot there. Um, what does the other stuff look like? The in the meantime stuff is kind of outside the police system. Yeah, and I think um, another question that came to mind as, as you were talking was, because you referenced, you know, we, we've tasked the police with doing a lot of things that, that we shouldn't be tasking them with. Um, and I have heard from, from a number of police officers who I have interacted with in a prof professional and personal capacity, and I'm sure you have as well, that say, you know, I'm not trained to respond to mental health like people. I'm not trained to do these things. I would prefer not to do those. I came to be a police officer to, to help keep people safe. Like that's my, that's the function I really want. Why do you think we're not hearing the support from the police officers about taking some of that money away to address some of those things that don't fit neatly within that box of of safety or public, you know, safety police functions? Why do you think we're not seeing that support? I think there's a, f I think there's a few reasons, but I could be wrong, right? I'm not, I'm not a law enforcement officer. This would be great. I mean, I would love to have the answer. Um, but I think the first one is that we have um, set up an adversarial narrative that is either you are for this or you are for that. There is no in between. Um, you're, everybody's right and or wrong. Um, and that it is actually not about a critique of the system, it's a critique of me. And I think a lot about, um, you know, I, I did a lot of work with education with the teacher. I mean, I love this district. I went to all my schools in this district. So I would spend Fridays when we weren't in the legislature in any classroom in this district that I could. And you hear teachers talking about um, their curriculum and how we can incorporate more anti-racism into it. And they talk about the, um, the opportunity gaps that exist in education and they will talk about this. And, at, and we talk about it all the time. And at no point do teachers hear you're racist and you're the problem, right? They understand that whatever we're doing is giving us this bad outcome and we don't wanna do that anymore. And what can we do to fix it? And so I think we have to lean more into that mentality of, um, of like, this isn't what we want the outcomes to be anymore. So how do we change that? Um, but it, it really has become like an adversarial relationship. So the the first thought is like, the system that I'm in, you don't like, and therefore you hate me, and therefore we are at odds with each other. So I think that's a little bit of it. Um, I think it's also really hard um, for us to, to think about what we haven't had before. 
that's just a, a, a you know function of being non-imaginative people. Um, and so I think then it just becomes scary. And fear, anger are two of the easiest emotions to evoke. There are two of the easiest emotions to hold on to. And so we have a collective duty and opportunity to start leaning into humanization, worth and dignity for all people and having conversations around that. It's so much easier to have the opposite kind of conversation, right? It's like the ease with which you can you can do that. Um, and, and then you have to acknowledge too that there is like, it's hard to ask people who are experiencing oppression to experience it quietly, right? And so like, that is also a very real aspect of it is that it's an emergency and it's about people's lives and their, their livelihood and, and their actual living. I did a teletown hall um, three weeks ago where we called, um, we had 600 black Minnesotans on a phone doing a live teletown hall, answering questions like, what would make your life easier? Press one if it's this, press two if it's this. 46% um, of people who answered, and it's entire state of Minnesota, 46% of people who answered the question, what is the number one um, concern you have right now was uh, police being able to hurt me or my family without consequences. Mm -hmm. And that was just, I mean, it was in November. And I was, I was really surprised about that, right? I, I, I obviously know it's a concern. I certainly know that it's a conversation that's happening in uh, Minneapolis, but it was all over the state, 46%. And then I had a grandma ask me, um, I have a, a grandson who lives with me and he won't leave the house because he's scared of police. And I don't know what to do. What do I do? And I was like, I don't know. You know, so these are like the lived experiences of people right now. And so that is a level of urgency that also requires us to hear that and hear that it is about their lives and livelihood. And it's not about um, the system in which it, that's inflicting that oppression. It's about the oppression they're experiencing. And I think that's like... We, we try to like put it as like a, well, it's this or this. And it's like oppression is really bad. <laughs> so we like definitely should stop that. Um, I don't know if that, if that answered the full question, but I, I do think that that's some of where we get into the, the place. Yeah, and I think uh, I'll ask you one uh, more question. I wanted to, uh, you know, what you said made me think of this idea that I've been circling around personally is, is you know, sort of the demonizing the other and, and, it, and how much what I have challenged in myself is, that, that shuts down on any conversation on either side, right? And it's it's a comfort thing. It's a, it's a I don't want to question what I believe and what I think is comfortable. So I'm just going to say, you're wrong. I'm right. I don't have to do the actual hard work to get to a solution. And, and that, that is something that, so when I've had that reaction, because it's, it's easy to have that reaction, mm -hmm. uh, I had to sort of stop and question myself as to why I'm having that reaction. But I want to ask you one last question as we as we end here. Um, in you, in your view, uh, what can people do? What can people do to move this? You know, move the needle forward. Take the first step. What can the public do? Well, I mean, the public is big, right? So there's there's a lot of things that a lot of different pieces can do, um, and some of it is already happening, right? People are starting to have conversations about white supremacy, anti-black racism. What does that look like? I think it is inherent. Um, it is important for every person to really assess, like, what does white supremacy look like in your um, industry? Like, how is your industry built around it? Um, and so what does it mean to interrupt those characteristics of white supremacy in, in your industry? Um, I think people with power and privilege absolutely should be the ones who are out front saying, like, hey, I hear, I hear that, the, that there's fear around changing things. But can we listen to folks who are experiencing oppression and work with them to stop that? Because that, at the end of the day, is the thing that's happening that absolutely has to stop. Um, and people with power and privilege are in the best place to be listened to and taken seriously. Um, because a lot of times, you know, it's not until someone who's like not invested in the thing that starts fighting for it that people start listening. It's like, well, of course, gay people want to get married. But when straight people cared about gay people getting married, it was like, well, it's a different, you know, it's a different story. Um, and so I do think that people with power and privilege who actually probably have um, investment and benefit from it being the way it is saying, I am comfortable acknowledging that I'm comfortable with this the way it is and it should stop because it's oppressing other people and I'm willing to be part of what does our all of our liberation look like, right? Um, it's having conversations with friends, it's having conversations with your colleagues, it's doing things like this. But I think especially for people with power and privilege showing up to your legislators, to your city council members, to your county commissioners, to whomever it is that wields those levers of power to be like, I want you to do this thing, right? And I'm going to be there with you when you do this thing. Like we have to show up. It's 
a participatory uh, thing, democracy, right? We got to keep showing up for it. And so it's the way we designed it just is how it is. And if it's not participatory, then it's like, you know, an authoritarian and that's terrible. We don't want that. So. My dad always says it's, you know, 90% of the battle is just showing up. Uh, it is. That is so true. It's the, it's the advice I give to college students. I'm like, just go to the thing. Just go to the thing. Right. You just show up. It's most of it. Yeah. Well, uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, Aaron, I really appreciate your time today uh, in discussing how you envision uh, uh, reimagining the police and the criminal justice system and, and public safety. So we really appreciate your time. Uh, we hope you have a, a wonderful holiday. Um, and hopefully you'll join us for some of these uh, further talks again. Happy to, glad to. Um, thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation. I, I look, I'm gonna hopefully like tune into other ones. In the sure. That's great. We have another one coming up, uh, I think January 21st with uh, Nikima Levy Armstrong. That's our oh, next awesome. one. If I'm not there, will you tell her hi for me? Okay. I will. I will. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.